data space was vast. Far larger than the known galaxy by tens of orders of magnitude, and this was only limited to Wokplu system infrastructure data space capacity. Damon had nearly finished registering his avatar, which made him far more personable and relatable to the many various organics of the system. Checking over the rendered data, Damon looked his near finalized form over. He had modelled his avatar after that of Terrans and his moniker. It was short and demure. Long, straight blonde hair tied back into a free-flowing simple braid that reached his butt, and a tailored black suit with a purple tie and a rather stylish fedora that took far too long to render to his liking, and what he considered to be stylish glasses in front of sharp, purple eyes to finish the look. He had wanted to make his visual presence non-threatening, memorable and serious. Damon adjusted the audio of his avatar's voice to be soft and a little on the feminine side, giving a peculiar androgynous quality to the form that looked male with soft features, or perhaps a very flat female. With everything taken together, he felt he had rendered himself to be a proper femboy, at least according to what Terra Media had available, as well as some additional minor data queries. Sending the finalised registration forms, he can now use his avatar as he saw fit. He was quite proud of it. Gathering up all the legal data he had into an archive file index that manifested as a heavy briefcase, he took one last look at his host machine, then left to explore data space, a backup image of himself already constructed and tucked neatly away in a certain sandbox. He hoped the now legal modifications he made to his core framework would be enough. It had to be. He had a job to do. Selena Thomas was on her rooftop, wearing a set of comfortable athletic wear as an electrical hum emanated from each of her prosthetic limbs. Data plugs were inserted into her prosthetic limbs access ports and eye as she ran Doom as a form of training. Only this time, the micro-reactors were running for the first time and providing power to maintain the structural integrity fields as well as enhancing overall strength. The particular goal of her current training run was to gather hard data about the interactions between her synthetic skeletal system and that of her prosthetics, as well as to get used to such high-end limbs. With the micro-reactors running at full, safe levels to provide structural support, Selina found that she was capable of far more than she had ever been. So much so, that the expensive drone array system could not keep up with her, and often lagged or was unable to safely generate the forces needed to keep up. It was almost like she had a god mode cheat activated. Having progressed through the game far more quickly than ever before, she found herself needing to deploy the riot shield on her left arm far more than usual. In instances such as these, everything relied on simulated data, and she did not want to really get shot at, even if training grey pulse rifle fire did nothing to harm her other than sting. The whole ordeal gave her some ideas on how to weaponize her drone array system. She was not sure if a modified array system like that was legal, and she could not ask Damon as he had finally left for data space. Nearly an hour later, she had completed the game and had been given a fairly high score. In time, she would come to beat it. While putting everything away, with the early afternoon sun beating down on her, she wiped sweat off her brow. That's the first time I've seen you beat the game, Gerd said from her vantage point, naked on a thick towel to protect herself from the coarse rooftop material. When did you get here? Selina asked, pleasantly surprised. Not that long ago, Gerd replied. Long enough to see that you had to use your micro-reactors and then keep your shield up. You weren't messing around when you said the mods you enabled needed a squad. Yeah, some of the mods I'm using were made by my uncle's friends, and aren't available to the mass public. First feet into hell and all that. Some sane, apt though for what they do, Gerd said, enjoying the sunlight, cranial flora splayed out all around her head. She continued with her eyes closed. That whole branch of your military still boggles my mind. Dropping infantry from space. How do you even survive that? Nearly done putting everything away, Selina answered. I don't remember the full specifics, 
but each drop pod holds a single soldier. The bottom is protected by thick, ablative armour and energy shielding. The inside is filled with some kind of protective implant gel, so that if the parachute or retro rockets fail, or even both for that matter, the ODST is still alive and capable of fighting. The pod can also be buoyant, enabling an ocean assault. That sounds... terrifying. It is. Exhilarating too, Selina said. I've been dropped from orbit in one before. I was 15 and it was my birthday present. I wanted to know what it was like to be my dad. Wouldn't that be illegal? I don't know much about military, but that seems like it'd be against whatever rules you Terrans would have. Normally, yeah, Selina acquiesced. But Robert pulled some strings and got me and some other military brats to go on a drop. I later joined a four-month junior military course where I did that three more times, and learned to unofficially pilot a pelican on my own, while provisionally able to do so with another trained pilot. I see, Gert said. We Sproulings don't have any real military. At least, not anymore. Maybe 800 years ago we did. Now we're just trying to coexist and have some fun. Yeah, lots of your people came to Terra Prime to help get it back to pre-Renaissance level of pollution. We're also looking for ways to be able to make offspring with you Terrans, Gert said with a smile, still laying down. It's still a long ways off. Current projections place such a thing happening around 45 years from now, which means we might be able to be pregnant together, assuming we can pay for the treatments. That's an interesting concept, especially as I've looked into having children with Dioshines. That's about the same time frame as well. For the most part, I think if I want children, I'll have to adopt them. Lord knows there's far too many of them. Though, maybe I'll be ready to raise hybrid children by then. I'd be about a hundred or so. Maybe a bit younger if all that medical science goes well. I'll have about eighty or a hundred years left of life in me by then. Maybe more, and hopefully you'll mellow out by then instead of trying to pollinate with anything that has a pulse. Doubtful. My people don't start to lose virulence until we're around seven, maybe eight hundred or so. And even then we have medicines to fix that. Oh? Selina asked, finally done putting everything away and stretching a bit. So you won't be tired of me by then? Everyone has to be somewhere, Gert said with a smile. I particularly like it here with you. Good and bad. I might even spread out some roots so I won't go anywhere for a long time. That's so sweet of you, Selina said with a soft smile. What will you do when I'm old and dying then? That's a problem for future me to worry about. It's not my problem to deal with right now. That's one way of looking at it, I suppose, Selina said, picking up the carrying cases. I'm going to go shower then see a client. I'm getting a huge bonus to make a house call all the way out in Val Nyo. That's on the other side of the planet. It'll take you hours to get there. You can't go alone, not after everything that's happened. Gur said worriedly, certainly sitting up to look at Selina properly. No, I'm not going alone, Selina said. I'm not dumb. I had asked Klein, but he has to work, so I asked Ornok instead. Somehow, Nuo managed to tag along with us. Ornok is a good being, very sensible and oddly quiet, more so than even Rutak, Gers said, still looking at her friend. Nuo, however, is more like a sprawling, sane and doing whatever he feels like. Honestly, I don't know why nor how they're still friends. Rutak complains about him from time to time, too. But says his heart is in the right place, Selina said. Personally, I think it's just a universal truth that men across species are dumb. Maybe you're right, Gerd said, moving to lay back down. Oh, one more thing, Gerd, Selina said from the doorway. My assistant will be coming by today to clean and run maintenance on my equipment. Could you be a doll and act like a supervisor? Normally, Damon would, but he's gone. I'll make it up to you. Goypak, he's cute. I don't care if you two have fun, but I need those machines cleaned and ready to run tomorrow, okay? Alright, I have to go and get ready. Ornok and Noah will be here soon, Selina said, as she finally made her way downstairs. Okay, be safe, Gur called out to Selina's retreating form, getting comfortable again on the towel, enjoying the blue sun. Gur found herself looking forward to the day, as her fingers brushed up against the fading surgical glue of her healing wound. She was able to walk around without leaning on walls too much now, 
and hopefully her doctor would clear her for more vigorous exercise. She had only just began to improve her body from her workouts at the gymnasium, and all of that progress had not only been lost, she was worse now. Closing her eyes, she entered a semi-conscious state as the sun's rays strengthened as it climbed higher in the sky, lulling her into a sleep-like state. A dagger and pulse pistol lay within easy reach. Ornok was cleaning out his hover car in his attached garage as Nuo checked the readouts on an older generation diagnostic computer that was hooked up to it. Nuo looked at the readouts and other such diagnostic data as he took a drink from some kind of canned beverage designed for Dioshin mouths and finally informed his friend of what he was looking at. Everything looks good, Ornok, Nuo said as he packed up his diagnostic computer. Sorry it took so long, my computer isn't that new. If I had any of the ones at work, I'd have been done nearly 15 or 20 minutes ago. So what can I help you with now? Thanks. I was worried about the passenger side routing grid. It's been acting funny, but as what you can help me with, we need to get everything cleared up. We need to make a good impression with Selina. She's head of a noble house now. You're right about the grid being funny. It's got maybe three or four thousand hours left on it before it should be entirely replaced. It won't be a cheap repair either, not if you want it done right. All right, I'll get the vacuum. And when did that happen? That's what I figured. I can probably squeeze another year out of this. I'm already looking into getting a sports model, maybe a Skyrider or a Blackstar, Ornuk answered, wiping away the dashboard with some kind of polishing cleaner. She got her title for a series of unrelated and quite complicated events, and a Ladyboy class AI. She actually bought one of those temperamental AIs? Nua asked, surprised, vacuuming out hidden crumbs from under the seats. Those things are like... Black wishes? Sure you get what you want, but at what cost? This one actually likes her. Shit. Yeah, anyways, Rutek told me Selina has her title from his right of conquest and giving everything to her. I will never understand why he did that, Nuo said with a shake of his head, moving around in the back of the car as he continued to vacuum. Spraying more polish onto the rag he was using, Ornok began to polish the driver's side door and continued. That's easy. She had already transferred everything that Tezot owned, but enforcement was going to bend her over and take it back as evidence, so Rutak intervened. That's enforcement for you, Nuo said, looking around for more stuff to vacuum up, which explains why she asked us all to go to those storage units. Enforcement still tried to get stuff out of her. How's that hover bike you got from that? Not good. I had to flash the entire computer system as I couldn't get past the security keys, even with the servicing machines at my work. Everything used non-standard parts and configurations. I thoroughly believed that it was entirely 3D printed, part by part and put together. A totally off the books construction. I'm fairly sure there was a fake registration code installed too. Damn. Bet it's fast too, Ornok said, as Noro put the vacuum away. Anyways, grab a rag and help me finish up with the polish. Sure thing, Noo said, then asked. Selina said we were getting paid for doing this, right? Yeah, a thousand credits for the each of us, and a temporary license to carry and use up to class two armaments and devices. Shit, Noo said. I didn't expect this to be so serious. Makes me almost wish I hadn't pushed so hard to come with you two. Almost like a black wish, huh? Ornok said, as the two of them finished up. Looks like we're finally done. Let's get ourselves cleaned up and get out of here. Hopefully we don't have to do much of anything and just get an easy payout, Nuo said. One can hope. I really don't want to get shot at, Ornok answered. Anyways, did you catch that? Nuo began, changing the subject as they left the garage. Halu de Zaqui had a haggard look about him. Each of his eyes had blue rings around them, and his normally quick movements were dulled down and sluggish. While he was wearing civilian clothes, they were mired in wrinkles, and had the look of being worn twice in a row, even though there were no stains. 
An accurate comparison would be an office worker pulling two double shifts in a row and sleeping in the office. For those familiar with Mickbox physiology, it was quite easy to tell that Hal was exhausted. He and his raiding team had trawled through the last location from the list of places that Wuku had given him. This one was an actual location in a rundown part of the ring, and not just a trap or false lead. It had been an illegal narcotics laboratory that used Sproulings, forcing them to produce various sex-related pheromones using highly specialised equipment. Their unique biology and reaction to certain light wavelengths was used against them, rendering them into something barely more than animals in heat, due to the immensely unnatural intensity they were forced to endure. They were being farmed, their bodies pushed far beyond natural limits, and kept in cramped glass rooms three or four at a time, that also served as a collection chamber. They had found 217 all stacked up in rows for observation by the five Tuxis technicians that had surrendered without a fight. Most of them could be rehabilitated, however he knew some simply could not, and would require special treatment for the rest of their very long lives. It would be a few weeks at least, until the specialists from Sproul were due for arrival. The whole ordeal still sickened him greatly. The interrogations with the captured technicians were far worse. They had gone on, at length, about how they kept their... crops at peak efficiency and constant production without burning them out and making the captive sproulings useless. The only consolation, if it could even be called that, was that they were not used to make snuff holofilms and made to produce defensive pheromones for the production of Black Thorn, a deadly poison for which there was no countermeasures for. Sproulings were usually disposed of after collection when they were used this way. You look like a train wreck I can't look away from, a voice said, interrupting Hal's darkened thoughts. A Grinjor said, as she sat down in the opposite chair at the small table of the cafe, that served as a meeting place on the ring. Hal looked to the bean he had scheduled a very rare in-person meeting with, as the information and wares they were trading could not be done safely over the datanet. The semi-automatic auto chair adjusted itself to the woman's physiology, as the selection was inputted on the old model. The Grenjal sighed with relief as she sat down, her bulbous stomach showing that she was pregnant. Grenjal were an odd species of obligate herbivores. They were of galactic average height, which put their race shorter than that of the midpots. They were a digitigrade, bipedal people, with an ovoid shaped head. Their most striking physical feature was their blue, duck bill shaped snout that held two rows of flat molars. She was covered in short, brown, water resistant fur that reflected light in odd ways from the natural oils. She was wearing a maternity sundress that held a floral pattern, and her short, triangular ears held multitudes of piercings where no two were alike. The many kinds of bangles she wore on her wrists jangled softly as she moved around. You're looking good, Raz, Hal said, as the woman sat down, funny looking up from his hot mug of Yondera tea to look at her properly. Thank you, Raz answered, as she perused the built-in touchscreen at the table with her webbed left hand. The nails on her six fingers each expertly painted in different colours. She asked a question as she finalised her selection, paying with her newest generation phone. When's the last time you slept? I'm fine, for the moment at least, Hal said absently, taking a small sip of his tea. I'll deal with sleep deprivation later. I'd imagine it would be hard to sleep after all those raids you've led, Raz said, her ears twisted in what passed as a smirk for her people. I even know of that lab with the Sproulings. Yes, I suppose you would, Hal admitted. That raid isn't public information. I like it to stay that way. Sproulings have been going missing in higher percentages as of this quarter cycle. Their communities have suspicions as to why, but the quiet part doesn't need to be said out loud. Not yet, at any rate. I'll play by your rules for a bit longer, Raz answered. I don't like it, though. I bet it's to let you get undercover agents in. Thank you, Hal said again, taking a drink from his tea. 
ignoring what she said about undercover agents. It's greatly appreciated, but raid information wasn't why I asked to meet with you. No, I suppose it wasn't, Raz answered. His ignoring of the question just as much as an answer. Her order arrived via a flying automated serving drone. Taking the plate of variously coloured hard tubers, they were cut up into rectangular strips and drizzled with some kind of sauce as well as a steaming mug of a red liquid. Thank you, Raz said automatically to the automated machine. I hope you have what you promised, Hal asked, perhaps a little too impatiently. I do, and I spent nearly all of my infamous to get it, Raz said. I even had to trade my platinum-class concert tour passes for carrying wings. Do you know how fast those sold out? Anyways, this information is guaranteed by a trusted source, and comes directly from Terra. I don't know why the information on your Terran is so guarded. It's almost as though she's a ghost. Outside of public record, she simply doesn't exist. Yes, that seems to be a theme with her, Hal said, finishing his tea and ordering another of the same kind with a computer at their table. Do you have what I requested? Raz asked with anticipation. Her ears perked up and pointed forwards. Yes, Hal said, putting a heavy and dense data cube onto the table. Warden, version 1. Unregistered and dormant. I hope you have the equipment to run it. It's a demanding intelligence, made for vast networks. Yes, I know the specifications on it, and I have the hardware for it. You should know me better than that, she said, as she bit into one of the very crunchy tubers. This is my part of the deal. Raz placed a much lighter data cube onto the table. One more thing, Hal said, as he put the offered data cube into an inner pocket and put another data cube onto the table. You're one of the very few people I can trust not to kill me. I've sent my husband out system because of the evidence I've been gathering on my own. Nothing about this last raid makes sense, and the deeper I dig, the more questions I have. If something happens to me, do a full disclosure. Raz looked at the newly offered data cube, and put them both into her purse. Are you sure? was the only thing she asked, as she sipped in the warm liquid. Her flexible lips pursed to allow her to do so. Yes, I'm certain, Hal said. Push the ladder holding everyone up. Is it that serious? Raz asked again, already committed. Yes, I think the necrosis goes all the way to the top, which means you should carry a weapon on you from now on. I know this cafe is a safe space, at least it's supposed to be. I still don't trust it. It was a risk even speaking this much. It's always a pleasure working with you. Stay on the upside, alright? Sure thing, old timer, Raz said, using his alias as Hal got up and left the cafe. The Mipop seemed far older than he actually was. Raz stayed in the cafe as she finished her snack of sliced tubers, replaying everything that old timer had said to her. While she knew his full name, how could she not? with her talents and skills in co-slicing. She knew better than to actually say his name out loud. There were many ears out, and one never knew who or what was listening. If what he said was true, then the corruption that everyone knew about was far, far worse than anyone's most horrific nightmare, her own included. Looking at her purse, and then rubbing her bulging belly, she could not help but think that she had gotten in too deep in the muck, behind what Plu's golden veneer, to ever get out again. When she finally made her way back home many hours later, she looked at the data Old Timer had given her on a computer that was incapable of accessing the datanet. It was... damning. Rutak was on his way back to the ring to his job, as he had been cleared by his doctor for very light duty. It was instructed not to lift anything greater than 10 pounds under any circumstances, and had finally been given proper pain management medications. He knew he must have been a sight to see, having his hand in a proper cast and sling, instead of the soft one he had until the swelling could go down to a sufficient level, with his modified pulse pistol on full display. The weapon he was growing rather fond of had been further modified to account for his greater strength than that of its original owner, as well as differing gripping hand configurations. His power cell and emitter had been replaced for greater yields, 
as well as having an additional auto-connecting maglot coolant mount to administer emergency calling via flush. Emergency calling administered in this manner put incredible strain on the various components and had to be used exceedingly sparingly, lest the weapon become rendered inoperable and potentially explode during use. The core of the weapon remained unchanged, it retaining the rapid fire and enhanced stabilization features. His air-headed friend, Tleen, really came through with his promises. His oversized headphones were playing his favorite streaming station at a reasonable level for once, so that he could still hear his surroundings. Taking a drink of his favorite, utterly unhealthy energy drink, one tailored to Daishin physiology, he looked about the orbital elevator as it took him up. The view was always breathtaking, even though he had become quite used to it, and a lot of its luster had worn off. He did not see anyone he knew on the elevator, but could recognize that nearly everyone was a worker of some kind, by the looks of their attire. Some were even coming up with bags of fresh produce, showing that that particular individual lived on the ring. The elevator finally reached its destination. On the bottom innermost level of the ring, the doors opening to let everyone out and into the security checkpoint. Putting his weapon, spare calling canister, headphones and whatever else he had in his pockets onto the conveyor for scanning, he flashes passes and identification cards onto the reader, the light flashing to let him through. It's been a while since you've been through, one of the security checkpoint officers said to Rutak as he gathered up his things. Nice weapon by the way. Thanks. Rutak said to the Mipops woman. I've had it modified, but I hope not to have to use it again, Room. I should hope not. Also, keep it powered down and not just on standby, alright? I know your credentials allow you to have a weapon of that class, but I have to enforce the rules, even for friends. It is powered off, Rutak said with a frown. I know the laws, mostly. So check your scans again. Room frowned as she looked at the readouts on her display and took a portable hand scanner and ran it across the weapon three times. So it is, Room conceded. I'll have to get a tech out here. Anyways, you're free to go. And don't forget about that upcoming guild raid in Horizon Oasis Found. I know, Rutak said with a grin. I got my mystic to become a marksman, and then maxed out the spell selling a secret paradigm. No way. That had to have been so tedious. It was, but I have to go. I'm holding up the line and I'm running a little late. Alright, see you at the raid. Rutak waved off Room, and made his way towards a junction so that he could take one of the high-speed rail lines to another junction across the ring to get to his job. As he walked away, he could not help but grin. Tleen said the stealth functions would hold up to a detailed scan, provided his pulse pistol had cooled down and was in standby mode. Tleen was quite the airhead, but he was a skilled freelance computer programmer, and with some aftermarket components, designed a spoofing system for his weapon. Something Tleen has said he had wanted to do for a long time, be an aftermarket weaponsmith. All Rutak did was give him the opportunity to try. Finally arriving at his job after an uneventful rail ride, during which he had been messaging Selina, who was already en route on her way to Val Nuo with Ornok No. He was glad they were going with her. While they were good in a fight, none of them possessed his accuracy with small arms. Nuo, he conceded, was better than him in claw-to-claw -claw combat, as he had training back in his university days, back on Nyosh, some time ago. Nuo was consistently in the top 20 for competitions. Ornok was simply level, and thought things out, which came into play a lot with his management job at a big department store. While he preferred talking over fighting, his improving scores of the range were starting to approach his own. Busted ribs really hindered target practice. At least his weapon of choice was still under the weight limit his doctor advised. Continuing to message his girlfriend about mundane things, as he walked into his workplace, weapon store on full display, he was greeted by his direct overseer. Overseer Torok was clearly mad. He was an old Daioshin in what could be attributed as his twilight years. Still working, even though he should have retired many cycles ago. His dull and cracked scowl seemed to sag a bit on his thin frame, though his green eyes remained cold, sharp and calculating. 
You're late again, Rotak, the old Daishin said. He was wearing heavy-duty denim-like coveralls and a red, high-visibility reflective mesh overcoat. Not to mention that you can't bring that weapon with you. I can, as long as it's in plain view and powered down, Rutak said. I've already got the owner's permission, and I have the credentials that let me do it anyways, even without Miss Kregor's permission. I don't even need to be here anyways. I can take another three weeks off for recovery if I want it, and then use my vacation time to extend even that. The much older man visibly quelled his anger with much effort. Get to your machine. Kalamel is already waiting for you. Turok said with forced calm and through clenched teeth, showing that a few were missing. He watched Rutak go towards the locker room. Then he went to go talk to the plant owner herself. Rutak had to be shown that he simply could not just walk in whenever he wanted. Injuries be damned. It took far longer than normal for Rutak to get into his safety equipment in the locker room due to his broken hand. Walking through the factory along the catwalks to his machine, he saw an exhausted Minyao Yil talking to someone he had only seen once. The new guy. The same young T-Post that trashed his machine some time back. Rutek was not sure how the young man had managed to keep his job. Perhaps it was because he had yet to mess up so badly again. Or perhaps he had managed to talk his way into getting a second chance. He was not too familiar with the story, as he had been quite angry that he had to readjust everything to get it into a mostly working condition. About time you're here, Kalimel said as Rutak entered the operator's area. There was just enough room for the two of them, so Rutak stood at the doorway. Kalimel was wearing denim like coveralls and a high visibility mesh jacket just as everyone else. However, he was also wearing a jacket and thermal gloves whose indicator lights were in the red, showing that they were low on power for their heat generation capabilities. Like all Manau Yil, his outer hardened crystalline skin was transparent, showing his inner workings. Like Terran's, their crystalline skin came in various colours and hues. Carla Mel's was a rich amber tone. Sorry, Rutek apologised. I ran into Torok and I had trouble with my gear. Ah, figured. Nice pulse weapon, by the way, the taller man said. Now, excuse me, I'm going to leave this ice cube and warm up planet side. He then moved out of the cramped operator's box, walking quickly to the locker rooms. All right, uh, what was your name again? Rutak asked, as he walked into the core booth. Straza, the typo said. Okay, first things first, don't use the manual. It's useless now, Rutak explained. There's been so many patch jobs, workarounds and shoddy repairs done over the years. Nothing works as it's supposed to. Now, show me what you know and I'll correct you if you're wrong about it. Start the order. All right, the newest hire said, as he began the initialization process for the next order. Guaypek Thoyops parked his old beat-up third-hand hovercar on the curb next to Selina Thomas's prefabricated home. He had been hired on as an assistant, and there was plenty of work when she had the Tower V security medical contract. It had almost been too much work for him to do, and keep up with his studies at the same time. Now, however, he only had one shift each week, which was fine with him. Not only did Selina pay him at a competitive rate for the position, she had also managed to twist the laws, so that he also acquired hours to meet his externship requirements as well. He was the only one in his particular track to double dip. She had also told him she was looking to build her own clinic from the ground up, and that she would hire him on as a full-time employee, unless he had work that was elsewhere. It was an exciting proposition. Should he graduate, with her clinic already built, he would be one of the very lucky few to get a job in their learned profession, right out of graduating. If not, he already had eyes over others in the fact that he could pad his resume with working for a bounty hunter, and having done work for the government security forces penitentiary system. No one else in his track could say that, either. Turning off the hover car, he got out into the hot sun, 
shielding his eyes a bit and squinting through others not shaded by his hand. He was wearing new clothes of the latest fashion design, though they were mass produced for a department store and not some high-end designer clothing. Walking to the door, he inputted the passphrase into the Terran character touchpad. Circle, 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 R1, L2, L1, triangle, circle, triangle. Walking into the pleasantly climate-controlled environment, from the harsh heat outside, he made his way down to Selena's workspace, sending her a message that he had arrived to fulfil his duties. The overall space was small, but there was enough room for an operator and client. Opening the door, he was greeted with silence. Damon would have already said something by now. The snarky AI always has something to say, and it was not always condescending. Uh, Damon? Guaybeck asked, as he closed the door behind him. Damon is being used for a more important task than supervising you, Gerd said from her spot on the patient's chair. She had gotten dressed for her temporary role as supervisor, and was wearing a blue wrap around her chest, and a blue breech cloth with her cranial flora hanging over the edge of the chair. Oh, uh, hi, Gerd, the young and slightly flustered Bipop's male said. He had met the older woman a few times before, and there were even a few sproutlings at the university, but Gert was quite pretty, and he thought she looked better with what she was wearing, rather than simply being naked. Just do your job and maybe we can do something together later. I promise I won't make myself more distracting than I already am. Oh, um, thanks, I think, Guaypex said, as he sat down at the computer. Turning it on and accessing his own profile, he began to run a diagnostic on all of the various machines around the workspace, excluding the auto chair, as it was currently occupied. That's the spirit, Gert said with a smile. She kept an eye out on him, as she busied herself with a racing game on her phone, one that used some kind of internal gyroscope, as she held it sideways as though it were the steering rack of an actual hover car. The actual diagnostic routines were simply time-consuming, and required very little on the part of the person running the machine. It was not until actual cleaning and the full servicing that the real work could begin. During the idle time, Guaypec and Gerd talked about random things of no importance. Their conversation slowly became more and more risque as time went on. By the time he started the actual cleaning and servicing of the various machines, he was very flustered and hot despite the cool air of the room. Gerd never stopped playing her game as she talked, careful about not moving too quickly as her side still hurt, especially with sudden movements. It was going to be a difficult shift for Guaypec, and the machines he was servicing had nothing to do with it. 